Okay, we're back. So this time, the last time we talked about building up to the revolution. Now let's talk a little bit about the revolution itself. The uh, I call this uh, beyond Washington and Jefferson, the people's war for independence. And even though we're going to talk about both Washington and Jefferson at the same time, I, I think sometimes we really do forget that it really wasn't just the founding fathers. In fact, even though I say that term a lot, I'm actually not a big fan of that term uh, because I think it obscures the reality, which is that, you know, people really were, you know, a part of this. Uh, it really is from the ground up. And it was everybody, uh, men, women, children, Andrew Jackson, for instance, later to be president. Uh, he, he was in this at 10 years old. He was a drummer boy and later captured by the British. Um, African Americans, both free and slave. Now, slaves won't fight the revolution. Slaves were not allowed to have guns, uh, but they are doing things that that support the revolution. Um, but but many free African Americans, a lot of slaves will run away during this. Um, Native Americans, some are fighting for the British, some are fighting for the colonies. So it really is a people's war. And like I said, I think we spent so much time talking about. Uh, the founding fathers that we really do um, forget that something um, else we do forget how long of a war this was uh, for a long time we always said this was the longest former war the true war uh, unfortunately the war in afghanistan has surpassed it now uh, but other than the recent the current war in afghanistan uh, this war you know starts in 1775 with lexington and concord and goes all the way to 1880, excuse me, 1783, uh, with the final signing of the Treaty of Paris. Um, and of course, when Concord and Lexington began, there was no army. It was just uh, it, it was just local militia guys. Um, and the British would refer to them just simply as rebels. Sometimes those country people, a rabble in arms. So it's a war that started. Uh, as we saw the other day, you know, started uh, sort of by accident, uh, but but slowly evolved into a real war with two true armies on both sides. Um, after Lexington conquered, by the way, um, we do start seeing a lot of people join, even before we declare independence. 1,500 in Rhode Island, 5,000 in Connecticut, 10,000 in Massachusetts are all joining this cause. And then, of course, once George Washington is put in charge, you also start to get a lot of Virginians and other Southerners uh, joining this. And, it, you know, I've always been interested that how little we really think about this war. I mean, again, there's so few movies that have ever been made about this war. We don't really write novels about it. Uh, at least in the South, nobody reenacts it. Now, if you go up North, you do see a bit more. I mean, you know, you go to New England or New York, New Jersey, they're pretty into it. But even that, uh, it's nothing like the way people talk about the Civil War or World War One or World War Two. Vietnam War. It, it, it's, you know, this is the war that people forget really was a war. You know, there, there's very little passion about this war. Um, and, and and again, I've talked about this before, but I, I think also it, it's such a strange war, I think, for a lot of people. You know, you know, the the men all wore wigs. They wore those weird stockings. They talked very different. They looked very different. I, I think there is a, a an alienness about a, a strangeness about the revolution period that that later time periods just don't have. Um, this is a, a very famous painting from 1876. It's you know showing the Patriots. It's supposed to sort of be Abraham Lincoln. Of course, the late, of course, he wasn't American Revolution, but still Abraham Lincoln, sort of, and then George Washington, and what's really supposed to be John Adams, um, and you know, and, and, you know, the the song you can almost imagine them singing at this point is Yankee Doodle, right? And you know, Yankee Doodle is a very strange song. You know, if you have ever you know really thought about the lyrics. Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. It's like, what the hell is that about? You know, it's such a strange song. I remember as a kid thinking, what? Um, 
what's really weird about that song, first off, uh, that was a common thing for armies to sing to each other. At least, at least in Britain, that was that was the, every battle they would sing. Uh, we may in our military we may sing during training, you know, like as they're marching, but we don't usually sing before a battle. But in Britain they did, and uh, in fact today, um, before football, what we call soccer, they call football. Before football games, the whole crowd will sing. And in fact, I'll, I'll put up a couple of videos of, of people doing this today. I mean, and they really sing. You know, it's really weird. And what you're seeing when you see those football crowds do that is is a carryover from the old military tradition. So this weird song of Yankee Doodle Dandy is um, it was actually a song written during the French and Indian War in seven, you know, in the 1760s, and it was written by a British soldier making fun of the colonists. And this is when we were all British, and and yet there's, you know, so a Yankee, uh, like if we were in class, I'd ask you guys, what do you think Yankee means? And what almost everybody says is Northerner, but a Yankee does not mean a Northerner. Uh, a Yankee means an American. Uh, the reason we say down in the South, we say it means American is of course during the Civil War, the South tried to break away from America. So it was a war from the rebels versus the Yankees versus the Americans. So Yankee actually means American, we're all Yankees. Um, and we're not quite sure where the word comes from. Uh, there's a lot of guesses. The best guess is um, a lot of Native Americans in New England spoke French. They were French allies. They were Catholics. And when they referred to the colonists, they referred to them as the Anglais, you know, French for English. And with their accents and, and their mispronunciations, it sort of sounded like Yankee. You know, the Anglais, the Yankee, you know, I mean, it's a guess. It seems to be about the best guess. But by 1760s, the word Yankee just simply meant those people living in America. And they would have said Americans too, even though they were British, uh, in the same way we say Georgians or Floridians. It was the British living on the continent of America. So anyway, Yankee just means an American. So a doodle means a fool, someone who's not very smart. And a dandy refers to somebody who is overdressed, maybe a, a man who's a, a little bit effeminate, a little bit flashy, but does it in a, in a, in a bad way, who's not, who thinks he's fashionable, but not really. So if you go back through the song, Yankee Doodle came to town. So this American fool came to town because he clearly lives in the country. He's a bumpkin. Uh, riding not on a horse, but on a pony. So this, think of the image of a big guy on a little pony. He stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. So in other words, he's this big dumb guy is riding a pony, sees a dirty old feather on the ground, picks it up, sticks it in his hat and says, hey man, that's macaroni. Macaroni is an old English word that basically means cool or fashionable. That's all macaroni means. So when you break it down, suddenly you go, oh, it, it's it's basically the English making fun of us. And that was during, well, we were on the same side. Um, so during the American Revolution, they would sing this to us, but then we would also sing it back to them with different lyrics. There's over a hundred different versions uh, of the song. Um, let me give you one version that, that they sang uh, early on in the war. This is the British version. So during one of the battles, uh, one of the versions went, Yankee Doodle came to town to buy a firelock, in other words, a gun. We will tar and feather him, and so we will John Hancock. Yankee Doodle keep it up, Yankee Doodle dandy, mind the music and the step, and with the girls be handy. So this 1755 song, then becomes all these different versions during the American Revolution. And one last thing, one of the reasons we sing it as a patriotic song today is that's a very typical thing to do. Uh, people often will flip a word. Uh, you know, you know, if you think of country music, you know, 
they're constantly flipping terms like redneck or hick or hillbilly, you know, and singing it as a positive. You know, we hear that with racial terms. Sometimes a group will take a, a racist term and they'll flip it and they'll use it themselves in a positive way. So that's sort of what's going on here. Here is how the British saw us. This is, uh, again, you can see 1780, a version of how they portrayed us. This is the rabble in arms, the country folk, the Yankee doodles. And this is another vision of us. Uh, on the left, it's basically a Yankee doodle dandy. You can see somebody's just completely overdressed, but looks silly. Um, and, you know, you got what's clearly Native Americans and other people. And then on the very bottom, you know, there's this racial viewpoint of African-Americans as completely prostrate and subservient to the white colonists. But at the same time, uh, especially after we started winning the war, they began to kind of change their opinion. This is a drawing showing the colonists as kids, you know, and, and showing England as a schoolmaster, uh, somebody who can't control his students. So he's crippled, you know, he's got, he's got the missing leg, he's got the, uh, he's got the crutch, he's clearly old, and yet he's trying to hang on to uh, these kids that he can't seem to hang on to. And they're, they're making faces, they're mooning him, they're shooting spitballs at him. Now, you know, one of your your next writing assignment, as you know, is to read a couple of documents from this time period, including the Declaration of Independence, and write about it. Um, so let me talk a little bit about that. Um, the one you're going to read, obviously, is the Declaration of Independence, but there are actually dozens of these, uh, well over 100. Some people say it may have been as many as 200 may have actually been written, but at least 90 survive today, that we still have these documents, you know. Uh, sometimes it might be a church that would write one, an individual might write one, local towns wrote one, just colonies wrote one, where they just publicly stated that they were independent. And they did this before Jefferson wrote his. So when Jefferson wrote the true one, you know, the one that we all talk about, he was reading all of these. And, and frankly, he was copying a lot of them. But at the same time, I think this is kind of cool um, because it shows that our Declaration of Independence isn't just something that some rich slave owner, you know, wrote and now we're all copying him. He was actually collecting, if you will, the voice of the people and putting it all together, which makes it much more democratic idea but he did you know back then um you know plagiarizing was considered you know a compliment you know if, if i plagiarize you i'm complimenting you so it was really common for back then to just literally copy each other so he was obviously copying john locke we know that you know um if you remember john locke came up with the idea of the social contract they were clearly you know uh but he also um his his mentor jefferson's mentor his professor was a was a lawyer named george mason and george mason was also a big politician and in 1776 spring george mason wrote virginia's declaration of rights and that's what you see here and jefferson basically imitated that so i'm going to read you a little bit of the opening of virginia's declaration of rights and um, it says that all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights of which when they enter into a state of society cannot by any compact deprive or divest their posterity, namely the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. A little clunky, doesn't doesn't flow very well. But if you stop and think about it, that's exactly the opening of the Declaration of Independence. You know, all men are are, are all men are created equal. You know, he, this guy says, you know, so Jefferson's taking George Mason's ideas and just rewriting them a little bit. Now George Mason would go on 
to literally list um, what you might say is a bill of rights uh, that we won't have until 10 years later, but anyway. So here is, uh, you know, Jefferson's draft. This is, he wrote this up and he gave it to Adams and Ben Franklin, because remember they were all on committee and Adams and Ben Franklin sat down and they read it and they started changing it. And in fact, I'm, again, I'm going to post a video of them doing this. You could, you know, from that show, John Adams, and you can see them arguing and you can see how much they scratched out and rewrote it. Uh, but on that clip, the thing they really argue about is, uh, is the verbiage that Jefferson wrote that said, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable, that all men are created equal, blah, blah, blah. And Jefferson was not religious. He, he, he probably wouldn't say the word atheist, but he, he did not really believe in a personal God. He didn't really believe Jesus was the Messiah. You know, he was, he was you know, what they used to call a deist. Deist is somebody who believes there probably was a God that created the world, but that's it. And, and you know, Benjamin Franklin, it, probably, we probably do need to use the word atheist with him. So Jefferson and Franklin were not religious. Almost all of the other founding fathers were religious or to some degree. I think Washington was not super religious, but the others like John Adams were very religious. Um, so it's really funny. Uh, ben Franklin, first it's funny that Jefferson wrote that because sacred is a very religious term. And then it was Benjamin Franklin that was a little concerned about that. So he edited, he changed it to the word self-evident. We hold these truths to be self-evident. And so it's funny that these two non-religious people were arguing over religion. So anyway, apparently Jefferson said that this was the most painful thing he ever went through, even though he had lost his daughter, he lost his wife, you know, but yet for him, he was so angry that they changed his declaration. And since I said it's beyond Jefferson and Washington, I might as well talk about Washington. <laughs> um, it's fun to make fun of George Washington sometimes, you know, if you, you know, if, if you ask somebody who their favorite president is and they say George Washington, you almost want to snicker. It's like, really? That's what a little kid says. But actually, Washington really, truly is incredibly important. And even though he had his flaws, obviously, he was a slave owner, although he does free his slaves before he died. You know, um, he, he, you know, was not a super moral person you know the, the line about him is he liked his he liked his glass meaning he liked to drink he liked his glass he liked his lass and he liked his cards meaning he likes to drink he likes to sleep around and he likes to gamble um but he really was the best choice and and there's lots of reasons we win, but, and he's one of them. He really did know what he was doing. He's an interesting character. He, um, as I mentioned before, he uh, is the son of a tobacco farmer. He did not want to go into farming. He wanted to be military. He tried to join the British Army. They wouldn't let him in. He joined the Virginia militia. Uh, he kind of helped start the French and Indian War. I think I told that story a while back. Um, and then he eventually retired from the militia and joined it just went back to being a farmer he had a, his farm mount vernon about 15 miles south of what is now dc um, he owned a lot of slaves and then when the continental congress formed he went to it he was a member of it and he knew that at some point they were going to need somebody to run the military and he wanted to run the military so he got his wife to he designed it with a piece of paper, he drew it, and he handed it to his wife and he said, make me this uniform. So she did. And so when he went to the meeting of the Second Continental Congress, he was literally wearing a uniform that his wife made him. It was like cosplay. He's like in a costume, basically. And, it, and they did indeed choose him. And it was a good choice. He had never commanded more than 200 men at any one time. And now he's in charge of an army. I think three horses were shot from underneath him. Bullets went through his clothes. I mean, so many times he should have died. And he spends most of the war running away. And that's not a, a knock. He had to. So, you know, we had a tiny little army fighting the best army in the world 
there's no way we're ever going to win. So he would surprise attack and then run away. And then surprise attack and then run away. Um, anyway, I'll come back to that later. But he um, he really does something quite unique. He was very aware that everybody was watching him. You know, he was a general, later, obviously, our first president. He understood that everything he did was setting a precedent, was setting an example. And he does, he, he, he did something that so few people ever do. He willingly gave up power. Nobody gives up power. You see that all the time today, no matter how unpopular somebody is, no matter what kind of sex scandal, you know, financial scandals, doesn't matter. Those guys just keep going and keep going and keep going. Uh, I, I, you know, right now we're in, we're in election season uh, since it's spring 2020. Um, and we got Joseph, you know, Biden versus Sanders. Uh, there's no way the Bernie Sanders is going to win at this point. But does he give up? No, he's going to keep running. He's going to keep, you know, so people do not give up power. Clinton didn't give up power. Bush didn't give up power, even though they had problems. He does it. He does it twice. Let me tell you about the second time first. So as you know, he becomes president later. And after two terms, he stepped down. Now, there was no rule that a president could only serve two terms. That rule doesn't come into place until 1948, after Roosevelt served four terms. He died at the very beginning of his fourth term. So he only went 12 years, but he would have been 16. And if he was in good health, he would have ran a fifth term, no doubt. He loved being president. But at that point, he was a Democrat. The Republicans were like, no, two terms is enough. And to be honest, every president only did two terms until Franklin Roosevelt. And that's because of Washington. Uh, but, but there was no rule until Roosevelt. So he served two terms. And at that point, he said, I'm going to go home. I'm done. Uh, that's enough. Um, you know, and his argument was after two terms, you start to get too powerful and you run the risk of being a king or a dictator. Uh, and really, again, every president has imitated that all the way up until Roosevelt. And, and now it's officially law. But the first time to me is the most interesting. He. Um, at the end of the wars, you know, so so first off, you know, when the war begins, you know, only about a third of the colonists were for revolution. At least a third of all the colonists were absolutely against the revolution. They wanted to stay with England. And then about a third or so uh, weren't really sure how they felt. So one of the things that the government of the colonies, Continental Congress, tried to do is try to keep as many people as they could on their side. So one thing they did, they went to a lot of the landowners and a lot of the powerful people and said, look, join the Continental Army. We'll make you an officer. And when the war is over with, we'll give you land and we'll pay you. So they basically bought the loyalty of a lot of these rich people in the colonies. Anyway, the war is over at 1783. And a lot of these officers are angry because they haven't gotten their money yet and, and, and they want more power. In March of 1783, an anonymous letter was spread throughout the officers, basically saying, this isn't fair. We need more money. We need more land. They, they, they promised us all this. So on March 15th, they, they all decided to meet at a church in Virginia as a secret meeting of all the army officers. And what they were planning was maybe a second revolution. They were actually thinking about taking over this new government and putting themselves in their place. Now, they all loved the main, you know, the general commander in chief, George Washington, but he wasn't part of this meeting because they knew that he wouldn't support them because he was very loyal. Um, but they were eventually going to ask him to join them, but not yet. Anyway, George Washington finds out about the secret meeting and he shows up. About halfway through the meeting, he walks into this church and he has a letter from Congress and he walks up, it gets real quiet and he walks up to the front of the church and he stands up at the podium 
and he takes out this letter. And again, it's and basically it's a letter from Congress saying, hey, please don't kill us. We'll, we're going to give you your money. And by the way, they do eventually all get their money. Anyway, he starts to read it, and he has a hard time breathing. He's squinting. So he pulls out a pair of glasses and puts them on. And the whole place gets real quiet. And there, in fact, there's people going, oh, oh, my God. Because at that time, men did not wear glasses. Glasses was a sign of weakness. You were half a man if you wore glasses. Um, and uh, people like Ben Franklin didn't care. But somebody like Washington, that's something you didn't do. And he knew this. He had been wearing glasses since he was in his 20s. But nobody knew it. So he knew exactly what he was doing. So he puts the glasses on and, he, and, he, and everyone reacts. And he says, oh, gentlemen, uh, if you don't mind permitting me to put my spectacles on, for I have not only gone gray, pointing at his hair, not only have I gone gray, but also almost blind in serving my country. Then he goes on to read the letter. And by the time he finished this fairly short letter, a lot of the men had already left. The ones that were still there were crying. They had their heads down because he shamed them. He knew exactly what he was doing. He was basically saying, hey, knuckleheads, we all sacrificed for this great cause and you're going to throw it away for money. I've lost my eyesight, you know. And it worked. The, 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 the almost rebellion died down. Now, what he could have easily done is said, hey, let's go. Make me your king. Let's, and he doesn't do that. And soon after that meeting, he walked away from the military. He said, that's it. You know, it's time to go home. In fact, the, the, this might be surprising. Uh, the United States actually got rid of the military. We had a little militia. But that's why there's a Second Amendment. You know, to own guns was because we didn't have an army. The idea was we're the army. Um, it won't be until 1795 that we actually get a real military in this country. So anyway, and that was all Washington. He believed that once war is over with, you put down your guns. Uh, and again, Washington for many, many generations was truly revered. Uh, and for your conspiracy theorists, he was indeed a Mason, a Freemason. This is the Masonic Temple. Now, Freemasons, by the way, is it's just a gentleman's club. It's all it was. It started in London in the late 1600s. Um, Scotland had their own. In fact, it actually technically started in Edinburgh. Then it went down to London. And then in the 1700s, a lot of colonists were Masons. It's just a gentleman's club is all it was. Uh, but anyway, there is a Masonic Temple. It's basically a museum uh, for George Washington. And he did wear fake teeth. This was kind of new technology. Some of the fake teeth, like this one, were porcelain. Some were made of animal teeth. And some were made of human teeth. By the way, uh, these th this is before polygrip. So the, the teeth often would just fall out of people's mouths. It was really common. And it is funny to think of George Washington because he probably spoke like he had marbles in his mouth. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sorry. Um, and apparently if your teeth flew out of your mouth, which happened a lot, the etiquette was if, if it happened to somebody, you were supposed to look the other way, not say anything until they put their teeth back in. And then you acted like you didn't just see it. So um, anyway, I just love this idea of Washington's teeth just flying out of his mouth every so often and everybody pretending they didn't just see it. This is actually quite a famous little sketch. This is a sketch from 1779. Uh, it was just a sketch drawn by a soldier. And he is showing some of his fellow soldiers. So you have somebody who's very well dressed, you know, on the right, you know, actually has uniform, that you have a frontiersman. And then you have somebody uh, from uh, the Prussian army, which means German, that helped us out. And you even have an African-American, uh, you know, and again, we don't tend to think of uh, all the different types of people that were in this war, but it was a, a quite a variety of people in this war. So let's talk a little bit about the actual army itself, the, not the generals, but the real people in this. So our army was called the Continental Army, later, of course, the U.S. Army. 
And it was people from all walks of life, from all, I mean, we had Native Americans in there, you had African Americans in there, Spanish, German, English, French, you know, all these different types of colonies were in there, colonists were in there. They didn't have uniforms, by the way. Again, the drawing, you see some uniforms. Those are, by the way, those are based on Washington's sort of made up uniform that has had his wife make. That's what they're based on. But we got the uniforms. I mean, a few women made them, but basically when the French joined us, and we'll talk about that later, but when the French joined us, they gave us a bunch of guns and they gave us a bunch of uniforms. Uh, and I want to say this a bunch of times. It's fun. That people love to make fun of French. I'm a big Anglophile. I love England. So in English, they love to make fun of the French. But we would not be the United States of America without the French and the Spanish. Uh, yeah. Anyway, most of these guys showed up uh, were poor. Um, they, they had very few guns. And they, when they did have guns, they were in terrible condition. They mostly just wore their regular clothes. Um, they were completely untrained, which is why desertion was common. Desertion just meaning leaving. Now, in military today and a thousand years ago, it is common for soldiers to run away during war. We're human. We don't want to die. We don't. It isn't natural for us to kill people. So you talk to anybody who's ever been in war, they'll tell you that is one of the hardest things to do is not to run away. And it does happen a lot. That's why military training's there to keep you from doing that. But it does happen. That is not what I'm talking about here. I don't need to mention that. That's common. But in this war, the American soldiers, because they were not professionals, they were not trained, they didn't know that they couldn't just leave. So it'd be very common uh, for George Washington to have a bunch of soldiers and then get up the next morning and half the soldiers would be gone. He'd be like, where'd everybody go? Oh, they went home to milk the cow or see their wife. They'll be back in a couple of weeks. It was a huge problem because there was no military discipline because we weren't a professional army. Um, he eventually brings in some people to help train us and he brings in what we call Prussian soldiers, basically Russia, oh, excuse me, excuse me, basically German, professional soldiers that we basically hired to help us out. And then of course we get the French and Spanish later as well. A huge number of people died, but very few of them from actual battle. 17,000 of the U.S. Army was, first off, 23,000 died, which in a way is not as many as you might think. You know, in a war that went on for nine years, that's not that long, that many. Uh, but 17,000 of the 23 died from disease, smallpox, infection, influenza, things of that nature. Only 6,000 died in battle, and most of those died after the battle, you know, they get injured and then infection was set in and then they would die. Uh, 16,000 um, in the British Army, uh, 12,000 again from disease and 4,000 from actual battle. So altogether, about 10,000 soldiers actually were killed in battle. You know, one battle in the Civil War would have five times that many. So, uh, again, it, this is a much smaller scale war than I think people realize. And, and it, it was fought in a very different way than later wars will be fought. And I'll get into that in just a second. Those numbers would be much worse had George Washington not inoculated his army against smallpox. Because a lot of those 12,000 in the British army, smallpox is what killed them. So anytime you study war, any war, you, you always have to ask yourself, why did they, are they doing this? Because again, it's not normal for people to really go to war. I mean, I could ask you guys, well, why aren't you guys in war? I mean, we're in war right now. Seriously, we're fighting Afghanistan still. Uh, very few people are signing up to go. Nobody wants to go to war. Uh, so why do you fight? What makes you pick up a gun and be willing to kill people and to have to, to take the chance that you will be killed. So it's always a really interesting question. Why are they fighting? Um, again, a lot of these soldiers were poor. Uh, people who had money hired people to fight for them. You know, they literally would, would pay somebody to fight in their, in their place. Or if they had enough money, they could be an officer. That was, a, that was the other thing. Rich people tended to be the officers. Poor people were the foot soldiers. But they, were, but they really did fight for reasons. Uh, first off, the cause, you know, all the stuff we've been talking about, you know, you know, corruption, all that. 
But this was also self-defense. When the war first began, um, again, only about a third were for the war. And even they didn't necessarily want to fight. But as the British army comes in and starts to try to take back the colonies, now we're being invaded. Uh, there is a sense of self-protection going on. One of the reasons we don't talk about anymore is the ugly reason, and that's religion. Uh, remember the Quebec Act that, you know, that a lot of people thought meant that we were all going to be turned Catholic. It's not true, but that's what we thought. So again, fear of Catholic, that's the ugly reason. That's the only thing we don't like to talk about. Uh, in fact, George Washington had a real problem with this when he, uh, you know, took over the army. He There was so much anti-Semitism and anti-Catholicism. And again, a lot, you know, there were Jewish peoples in, in the army and there were Catholics in the army. And he kept saying, guys, you, you can't be like this. Um, not only that, but Spain and France, which fought with us, were all Catholics. And he was like, look, you can't be anti-Catholic. Uh, Washington was actually quite a tolerant person. As president, the, one of the first things he does as president is he goes to the synagogue in New York, obviously, you know, the Jewish church, and gives a speech, um, you know, and saying, everyone's welcome to America. His, in fact, his line was, we are not a Christian country. We are a country full of all kinds of religions, you know. So he was, you know, that was a real problem. The other thing that people fought for and it's why they still fight a lot of times. It's a job, it's money. You get food, you get clothing, you can rise in society, and that's pretty typical. On the British side, um, they are a professional army, so it is a job for them, so it's money, but it's also a duty. But at the same time, keep in mind, they are also fighting to preserve their country. I mean, they're furious that these colonists are refusing to pay taxes and are breaking away. They really are mad about this, but it is more of a job. And I think that plays a role. I mean, why people fight often dictates who wins. And it, it, as you can see, it's much more personal on the American side. It, it's in their backyard. It's, it's, they're fighting to protect themselves. The British army, if they're not fighting here, they'll be fighting somewhere. It's not quite as personal for them. The fighting itself is quite strange, I think, to modern eyes. The thing I remember always hearing as a kid, and in fact, the documentary you're going to watch, which is good, but it's not perfect, that they, they say the same thing and they're wrong. Um, what you always hear is that the British Army were really weird and they all fought in a straight line, marching shoulder to shoulder and all fired at the same time. And, and we fought like Indians. We hid up in the trees and we hid behind rocks. Uh, that's not really true. Some did that. Um, but generally speaking, the British Army was the best army in the world. And the way they fought was um, very specific to the technology. And anybody who um, is going to fight at that time with the equipment they had were going to imitate the British Army. And that's exactly what Washington wanted them to do. This is the main gun, the Brown Bess. We don't know why it's called that. It is brown. We're not sure why it's called Bess. It might have to do with Elizabeth. But this is the gun for the British Army, and our army had the same gun. It's known as a flintlock. And so there would be, you can see in that clamp, there would actually be a little piece of flint. And when you pull the trigger, it comes down and it strikes and it creates a little spark that then lights gunpowder, and then that gunpowder lights a fuse that goes into the barrel where the rest of the gunpowder is, and that causes a little explosion in the barrel, and that explosion forces a round metal bullet out the barrel and hopefully into your opponent. Now, these guns were not very accurate. Uh, they were smooth bore as opposed to a rifle, a true rifle. You know, you have rifling. Um, nowadays, bullets are more kind of elongated and oval shaped um, back then they were round it, you know and they wobbled quite a bit they wobbled in the gun and so when they came out they kind of wobbled in the air and they often didn't hit what they were aiming at at 100 yards you could about a football field you could hit what you're aiming at once you get past about another 50 yards you're probably not going to hit what you're aiming at 
And then anything beyond that, if you do hit it, it's not going to be deadly at all. You're trying to hit the person in their trunk, you know, so, you know, shoulders down to your waist, that area. Because uh, any bullet in that area is going to kill the person. Maybe not immediately, but if you get a bullet there, you're going to die because uh, you're going to get an infection. There's nothing they could do for you and you're going to die. So it's really weird. If you got shot, like say in the stomach, you might keep fighting, but you know you're dead. You're not going to last more than a couple of days. If you get shot in the arm or leg, uh, if it goes through muscle, you're probably going to survive unless you get infection. But if it hits bone, they're going to take the bone out. They're going to cut your arm or leg off. And then you might get an infection, and then you still might die. Um, these Again, these guns uh, were very cumbersome. Uh, it, well, first off, so these guys fought shoulder to shoulder, standing in a straight line. Part of that is because the guns were inaccurate. So by shooting all at the same time, you got a better chance of shooting uh, your opponent. It's also psychological. Uh, and I'm going to tell you in a moment how many steps it took to shoot a gun. And there's going to be a video also showing somebody doing this. And there's so many steps and it takes so long that it that it's really, really, really difficult to keep your morale up. But if you're right beside a bunch of other people, you there's the safety in numbers. And one of the things that soldiers always tell you in war is that they, they often care more about their fellow soldier's life than even their own. So if you're by yourself, you might go run away. But you're not going to run away in front of your fellow soldiers. So again, they knew exactly what they were doing. There, there was indeed um, uh, a, a, a method to this madness, if you will. One last little bit of the gun, then I'll tell you how they shot him, is the musket. And basically a small, sharp sword uh, that would be at the end of your gun. Um, this is the worst way to fight. Because you're basically just hacking each other up, cutting each other's throats, stabbing each other in the eyeballs. I mean, this is just awful. And this is the last thing you wanted to do. So if it got to the point where you're so... Oh, by the way, because the guns were so inaccurate, you had to stand really close to the opponent. You literally saw them, you know, eyeball to eyeball. Here, you're literally within an arm length of each other. So it's even closer. Oh. And so often when they affixed bayonet, the other side would just run away. This was the secret weapon for um, the American Army, the Kentucky Long Rifle. This is in the video, this is what they're gonna talk about. Um, these were made by German born colonists that uh, were really good at making guns. Uh, these were accurate up to 300 yards. These are the guys that climbed up in the trees and hid behind rocks because they could hit officers. Because officers, the way you usually did it, the, the soldiers would be fighting. And an officer would stand about 200 yards behind their men so that they wouldn't get shot. These guys would shoot officers because they could, they could, they could reach them. Uh, there's actually accounts of where the British Army is getting ready to fight a battle and they see Kentucky long riflers and they call the battle off because they're so scared of, of the effects of these. So this was our secret weapon. These are, again, showing, you know, in the early evening guns going off. And you can see it really is an explosion uh, in the gun, it, it, you know. And again, I don't know if anybody's ever shot a black powder gun, but they are very loud and um, so much smoke. And, you know, so if you, these things, by the way, weighed eight pounds. Uh, every gun was unique. They were all handmade. So, you know, if you have one gun and you pick up another one, you got you to gotta get used to it because it's all going to fire uh, differently. Um, so this is the, um, the process, I'm sorry, I'm finding it in my notes, so I, don't, so I don't get this wrong. So, um, so again, these, these were about five feet long altogether, again, eight to 10 pounds they weighed. Um, you, to load one of these guns, you, uh, you hold the gun vertical, you pull back the hammer, the half cock. You pull out a two inch paper roll, little packet of paper that has powder and the ball on it. You have to bite off one end of it with your teeth. That's the one thing you had to have to be in the army. You had to have your front teeth, which is why it's so funny that George Washington, the commander, didn't have his front teeth. Anyway, so you bite that off. You pour a little bit of gunpowder in the pan that's right by where the where the trigger is. And then you pour the rest of it into the barrel with your bullet and you tamp it down. 
then you put the, the, the rod that you tamped it out, you put it back on the gun, then you hold the gun up, you finish cocking the gun, and you pull the trigger, and then you do it all over again. And I'm, again, I'm, there's going to be a video that shows you somebody doing this. He's going to shoot three shots in, in a minute. And he, this guy's really good. But can you imagine? Soldiers are coming at you. They're shooting at you. Cannons are going off. You're about to die. And you've got to keep loading this gun. All these steps and then shoot and then do it all over again. Your first instinct is to throw the gun down and run away. And again, that's why they're marching shoulder to shoulder to keep you from doing that. So in addition to the men, there were indeed women in this war. Uh, not only did women help out behind the scenes, but some women really did fight. Uh, at least 3% of the army were actually women, unofficially. They weren't supposed to be there, but they disguised themselves as men. Um, for the American Civil War, that percentage is even higher. A lot of people don't realize how much women were in this war. So on the home front, women always pay the price on the home front because the men are all fighting the war. Uh, there's no law enforcement. Uh, there's a lot of chaos. So unfortunately, you see a lot of murder, a lot of thievery, rapes, uh, vandalism, and it's women paying that price. One of the things they did would be to have spinning bees. This is where women would get together and they would sew uniforms. They would sew flags, bandages. It was also a way to kind of keep everybody together. If you were a woman and there was a spinning bee in your town and you did not show up for it, very good chance that the next day the other women were going to come beat you up. That was a, they, or might tar and feather you. We know they did that. Um, but they also provided food. They provided uh, supplies. A lot of the women followed the army. They're called camp followers. And there, there's this rumor that camp followers were always all prostitutes. And it is true. You get a bunch of men together, you're probably going to have prostitution somewhere. But that actually was a very small number. Most of these women were women that were there because their husbands or their sons or their brother or their dads were in the war. Uh, they also believed in the cause. They wanted to help out. Also, uh, Washington originally didn't want women anywhere near the army. Um, I mean, he was sexist. It's old. You know, it's the 1700s. But he also knew that with all the men there, that if you're fighting a battle and you look over to your right and there's your daughter, or you look to your left and there's your wife, you're not focused on the battle. You're making sure they're okay. And he said, you know, they're a distraction. Plus, you had to worry about sexually transmitted diseases and unwanted pregnancies, things like that. Um, but very quickly, Washington realized he needed these women. He needed everybody. So he allowed women to travel with the army and they were expected to clean and cook. And in some cases they fought. The picture you see here is Molly Picture, who the story has always been that during a battle, her husband was on a cannon crew, you know, shoving the cannonballs in the cannon. She came out with water and he died. He got shot. So she picked up his rod and she started doing his job. And you can see the bucket of water right beside her feet. The problem is there's a Molly picture in just about every battle. She seems to be a made up person. However, lots and lots and lots of women did exactly what this character was supposed to have done. Women were constantly fighting a war, even when they weren't supposed to be there. So again, we do forget how much of this war was everybody's involved. What I usually do when we're in class is I, you know, everyone recognizes this as George Washington. So I usually have you kind of look at it and tell me what you see. And a lot of times people go, wow, he's tall, or I can see where he has fake teeth or this or that. And you know, it takes a while for somebody to notice the person beside him. Of course, an, an African-American slave. Um, that's a, a person named Billy Lee. He was Washington's personal slave. Wherever Washington was, Billy Lee was right there. Um, and even though it's master slave, uh, at the same time, as much as they could be in that sort of situation, they were sort of friends. Um, now, I guarantee Billy Lee would, if he could, would be anywhere other than near Washington, but but they were very close, despite the fact that they were master slave. Uh, Billy Lee carried his uh, his telescope, his personal papers. He sometimes sent Billy Lee on secret missions to deliver messages. Uh, 
But this is, as far as we know, the only painting showing Billy Lee, even though he always would have been within a couple of feet of George Washington. I like this one, this painting. Not only is it unique, and it's one of the few paintings to show a slave, uh, but it does remind us that sort of in the shadows of history, in other words, Washington gets the spotlight, but in the shadows of history are all these other people, Native Americans, women, African Americans. Uh, as we've already talked about, the first person killed in the Boston Massacre was probably Crispus Attucks. This is the uh, Harlem Renaissance painting of Crispus Attucks. But African Americans are very much part of this war. And it's interesting because they have a whole added level of complexity. Um, first off, a lot of these people were slaves. So there's that issue. Uh, many of them were runaway slaves. Or if they were free, many of them had families that were still slaves. So it wasn't necessarily clear whose side to fight on. Do you fight on the British side or do you fight on the American side? And we do see African-Americans choose both sides. Uh, the reality is the vast majority did support the revolution. You know, you have the declaration saying all men are created equal. And for a while, there's a lot of hope. You know, maybe maybe slavery will go away. And, and in fact, many, many founding fathers did free their slaves. Washington eventually does it. Um, then others like Jefferson never do it. Uh, but there was a lot of hope for a while. Uh, this also brings complexity to the U.S. because um, even though there's, there were slaves in all the colonies, by this point, the northern colonies either had already gotten rid of slavery or they did during the war. So this is when slavery really becomes a southern thing. From you know Maryland down, they don't get rid of their slaves. And in fact, there was a you know it, George Washington did not want African Americans to be in this war originally. You know, because he's a slave owner. That's the last thing he wanted. Um, it might inspire slaves to run away. But again, just like with women, fairly quickly, he realized, I need everybody, not just not just the white guys. I need the, I need everyone. So he does eventually allow free African-Americans to fight in the U.S. Army. But uh, one thing they very much made sure is that there were no African-Americans fighting in the South. So no free blacks were brought south to fight, and none of the slaves were ever armed. There's a lot of urban legends that both during this war and the Civil War, the African slaves were given guns and they fought bravely for the Confederacy, and it, it's all hogwash. Uh, and of course, the reason you don't give a slave a gun is because the slave will immediately turn around and shoot his master and free himself. So, uh, so there was a lot of tensions over. Uh, Africans, Americans in this war. And by the way, the painting here is uh, uh, an African American fighting in the British Army. So the presence of slaves was again kind of an, what we might call an Achilles heel. That means a weak spot for the colonies. And England knew this. So early on, before this war even really takes off, in November of 1775, Lord Dunmore, he was the royal governor of Virginia. Uh, by this point, by the way, he was trapped on a ship. Uh, they, the, the rebels had already burnt his house down, so he was literally on a ship in the James River, but he issued this proclamation. It basically said, any slave in Virginia who can run away and come to me, I will train you to be a soldier and you can fight for the British Army. You know, you can basically kill your master. No. About 800 slaves escaped and did that. By the way, at, at the last lecture, I mentioned the term magazine to refer to a place where the guns were kept. This is the magazine in Williamsburg, Virginia. Williamsburg, at this point, uh, was the capital of Virginia. And um, we talked about Boston and how the the army went to Boston and that started, you know, to take the guns and then we get Lexington conquered. Well, in Williamsburg, this doesn't get talked about much, but in Williamsburg, the exact same thing happened. Uh, the British army came to Williamsburg also to take the guns away. And in fact, uh, the local militia uh, took all the guns already. And that's when they burnt the governor's house down. And so anyway, but then anyway, this is what a magazine looks like. So a few years later, General Clinton of the British Army issues another proclamation. 
It's exactly the same thing. If you can run away, come to us, we'll train you. Tens of thousands of slaves did it. 20,000 just in Virginia did this. 30,000 in South Carolina. All together, about 80,000 slaves runs away to the British Army during the Revolution. And of course, the question is, and maybe this would be a good question for the exam, um, why? Why the difference? I mean, that, this is how history works. It's not about facts. It's about what do the facts mean? So you see these facts and it begs a question, 875 versus 20,000 in 79, if we're talking about Virginia. And we don't have an exact answer. Um, I think I think a couple of the answers, though, uh, one is during the war, it is chaos. And so it's easier to escape. I think that's part of it. I think it was easier to escape in 79 than in 75. However, I think the other reason is um, in 75, I think there was a lot, you know, because remember, most of these slaves were born in America. And their parents were born in America. They were American. They weren't African anymore. They were truly American. They may have been slaves, uh, but they were American. This was their home. Africa was not their home. They don't want to go anywhere. They want to stay here, but they also want to be free. So in 75, I think there was a real sense that they may be freed one day. And again, some were freed. But four years later, by that point, it was obvious slavery was not going away. Even if the colonies win, slavery is staying. So I think at that point, uh, many African Americans said, well, you know, we, we, for four years, we stayed loyal. We're out of here now. And like I said, about 80,000 do this. And what's really remarkable is that, you know, Britain loses the war. They go home. They honored their agreement. Those 80,000 African Americans remain free. And most of them wind up back in England. So it's really funny today, if you go to the UK, I mean, admittedly, most people in the UK look like me, but there are a number of people of color in Britain. And some of those people go all the way back to this time period. In other words, you have African Anglos, but at one time they were African Americans. And this goes, this is when that started. So when we talk about the American Revolution, again, you're going to watch a documentary about this, but just very quickly, when you when you talk about the American Revolution, we're really talking about three phases. The first phase was in the North, starts in Boston, and then spreads from Boston throughout Massachusetts and eventually uh, to New York and Philadelphia. Then there is kind of a switch. Uh, it also goes international. 1778 is when France and Spain joins us. And so the war is not only fought in the colonies now, it's fought in the Atlantic Ocean, it's fought in Europe, it's fought in Africa. It becomes, basically it becomes the French and Indian War part two. And then finally, there's a shift from the North to the South. So in the last couple of years of the war, you get fighting in Georgia and the Carolinas and ultimately the last battle in Virginia. Now you may be going 1781, I thought the war ended in 1783. The last battle of 1781, the war is not over with for two more years. So, so in the north, you get a couple of events. Uh, the big one was the invasion of Canada, also known as the invasion of Quebec. This is probably the biggest mistake Washington made. There was an assumption that the colonists living in Canada wanted to join us. And they didn't. So Washington invaded Canada and his goal was actually to get Canadians to join us. But what it really was, was an invasion. And it really looked like the colonies weren't fighting for freedom, but were fighting for conquest. It was a big mistake. In fact, uh, we, we lose badly. And it, by the way, it creates a lot of anger between Canada and the U.S., which is why in the War of 1812, uh, we always talk about, you know, everyone always says the second revolution. That's when we bit, beat England again. And, and, but we also talk about how England burned down Washington, D.C. during that war. So it's not really right. We beat England in the War of 1812, but the War of 1812 was also a chance for Canada to get revenge on us. And Canada, it was a bunch of Canadians that actually burnt down 
D.C. in the War of 1812. And in their minds, they beat us twice, this battle and that one. Anyway, um, this was probably the biggest battle. The other one was the Battle of Saratoga. In fact, there were actually two battles of Saratoga. Um, this was an attempt by the British to take New England, and they lose. They lose badly. This was a major victory. Most of our early victories were because we fought and then we ran away. And then we fight and we ran away. And so people looking from, you know, like Spain or France were looking at us going, well, you guys aren't really winning. You're just running away. This was the battle that showed for the first time that the colonies could win. Because this was a full on battle. We, there was no running away. There was no sneak attacks. We fought the British on the battlefield and we won twice. This is the turning point of the war. So uh, because of this battle, and again, like I said, it's really two, um, you know, by 1777, there was a lot of people going, maybe we shouldn't do this anymore. Maybe we need to stop this. This restored the belief that we could win. And the real reason this is the turning point is because it brought in France and then later Spain into the war. Remember, those are the two countries that lost the French and Indian War in 1763. Spain loses Florida. Uh, France loses Canada. France loses a lot of territory out west. They want that land back. They want revenge. They didn't want to join us at first, but once we proved that we could win, now they're going to join us. Now, by the way, without France and Spain, we don't win. Even though we won Battle of Saratoga, uh, there's no winning this war without outside help. It's like a Little League team playing the New York Yankees. It's just not going to happen unless you get some pro ball players on your side. Battle of Saratoga, by the way, was completely embarrassing for England. And so here is a, a newspaper cartoon making fun of, of England. It's like, this must be how the military trains. If, if they're losing Saratoga. So you have people fighting with swords that have handles on each end. You, you know, they're playing with cars, they're playing with cap guns. You know, I mean, England cannot believe they lost Saratoga. So that takes us, the Saratoga takes us into that second phase. So like I said, France joins, a little bit later, Spain joins. We have an alliance with them. Um, and now suddenly it becomes a world war. It is fought all over the world. And um, to give it away, England will hang on to most of their stuff. They're going to keep Canada. They're going to keep India. But they are going to lose some territory. And they're going to lose a lot uh, of men. And remember, England was still broke from the first war. And now they're having to fight yet a second war. And by the way, this war is going to break France. France is also broke as well because they lost the war earlier. And even though they're going to win this one, they're going to be in such debt that it's going to lead to a French revolution in 1789. And we'll be talking about that in another lecture. So in so after the war turns international, England starts to get much more desperate. They know they're in trouble now. So they change their tactics. Lord Cornwallis, a general, goes to the south. You know, again, remember the war has fought in New York and Boston and Canada. After Saratoga, England goes, all right, we're going to go to the South. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The South was more loyal. I've, I've, and I've said it before, you know, the way we talk, the way we act is very British. We don't think of it that way, but it is very British. Um, and the South was very British back then. And, and most of the loyalists, meaning people who didn't want to go to revolution, most of them lived in places like Georgia and the Carolinas. So England knows that. So Cornwallis is heading south, hopefully to get some of those loyalists. In fact, South Carolina, by the way, was fighting its own war amongst itself. If you've ever seen the movie The Patriot, not a good movie. But still, if you've ever seen it, that's what that's about. It's about South Carolinians, loyalists versus rebels fighting each other. So England said, we can take advantage of this. We can bring the south back to our side, and then we can, from the south, take over the rest of the colonies. And it's a good plan. The other reason they're coming south is slaves. They're hoping to in, to create slave revolts and get slaves to join them because that's the weak spot and they know it. Um, and, you know, 
they're hoping that slave owners would much rather keep their slaves than be independent. So they're really rolling the dice. So he comes south. So George Washington has to remain because he is in charge and he also serves in the government. He has to remain up north. So he sends uh, Nathaniel Green, you know, sort of, which was almost like a mini Washington, if you will, sends Nathaniel Green uh, to the south. Um, he was 38 at the time. Um, and uh, he, again, Washington had trained him and his orders were, you know, never give up. So they would fight a series of battles, Cornwallis versus Green. These battles were very quick. Sometimes they lasted a couple of hours. I think the shortest one was 30 minutes, you know, and Green lost most of the battles, but they'd fight, they'd lose, they'd get up, keep going, fight again, get up, keep going, fight again. And to the point that Cornwallis finally decided that this isn't working. And so what Cornwallis decided to do after a battle at Guilford Courthouse in North Carolina. And you can see on the map to the right there, um, Cornwallis decided to head back to Virginia. His plan was he was going to go to Virginia. He was going to meet up with some other troops and then they were going to march with a giant army down into the south. But it looks like he was retreating. He really wasn't, but it looked like he was retreating. And at that point, Green sent word to Washington, hey, they're retreating. So Green followed them into Virginia. At the same time, from the north, Washington came down with soldiers. And then from the Atlantic Ocean, the French military came in on ships. And what they ended up doing is trapping Cornwallis and his men in a town called Yorktown, which is ironic. Yorktown is about 20 minutes away from Jamestown. So uh, 1607, Jamestown is founded, the beginning of British America. 1781, 20 minutes away, the British end their colonies in America. And it began and ended almost in the exact same spot because uh, with this battle, the British surrender and pretty much end the war. So this is, even though there's gonna be a lot of skirmishes later, what we call guerrilla warfare, um, but basically, this is the last major battle. Uh, this, this really is it. At this point, the British government and British people were like, we're sick of this. This is ridiculous. I can't believe we're still fighting this war. We've got to negotiate peace. For two years, they're negotiating peace. But it's not just peace with us. They also have to negotiate with Spain and France as well. So it gets very complicated. Um, but Yorktown is what really ends the war. So it's the last major battle. Uh, you get the Treaty of Paris that officially ends the war. Um, and, you know, and again, I, I forgot the exact number, but I want to say it's about 80, 90,000 soldiers ended up, uh, surrendering altogether and, um, Washington, you know, keeps them. It was again, incredibly embarrassing. So again, after the war, this is a, a cartoon in Britain. You see John Bull with his hands up. And you see the French and Spanish laughing as they're picking his pockets. And then up top, you see the colonists, America, flying away like a demon. And then he is flatulating. <laughs> Poor John Bull. Ha ha ha. But he's literally flatulating that. <laughs> Not a very nice image of America, by the way. And then here's Lady Britannia. Again, the image of, a, of Britain carved up. She has been demolished. She has been uh, ripped apart by this war. And below, you can see the colonists and others, you know, looting the British army and walking away. So why did we win? Now, I know we're like, we're America. We always win. But really, we shouldn't have won this war. Uh, we were nothing. We, we, we didn't necessarily fight better. We definitely didn't have better equipment. We didn't know what we were doing. So why did we win? Because we shouldn't have. Well, uh, part of it was Washington and Green. You know, they really knew what they were doing. And they knew that um, they could just outlast the English. And this is a really common thing in history. Uh, there are so many times where a small power can beat a large power, not by pummeling them on the battlefield, but by making it so hard. 
it's like me. I, I'm I'm a wimp. I, I you know, and some of you guys are pretty big. Um, I can't beat any of you guys up, but I could poke you in the eye and run away and then come back and hit you in the back of the head and run away real quick and then come back a little bit later. And, and then, you you know, or take your wallet and just run. And you might just say, oh, I'm so sick of this guy. I'm like, screw him. He can, you know, so that's kind of what Britain did. We see it in our own history. We see it in Vietnam. We see it in Afghanistan, Iraq. And they're not beating us, but we get to a point where we just go, oh, it's not worth it. Let's just go home. That was the plan. And it worked. Fighting in your homeland also makes a difference, too. England also made some big mistakes. Saratoga was a big mistake. Yorktown was a big mistake. And when they, we made a mistake with Quebec, but their mistakes had bigger consequences. And really, the main reason is France and Spain. I know I keep saying it, but that is the main reason. We really do owe them quite a bit. So this is the treaty that ended uh, the war. And, and it's at this point that we become the USA, not 1776. Even though we always say that, this is what made us the US. Uh, this treaty officially recognizes us as an independent country. Uh, we also both returned POWs, prisoners of war to each other. We set boundaries between, you know, because Canada stayed British, so we set official boundaries. And, uh, and then Florida goes to Spain. So Spain had Florida for 200 years. Uh, Britain had it for 20 years, now it goes back to being Spain again, and it will stay Spanish until 1821. By the way, this weird painting here is uh, when the, you know, the, it, the negotiations were held in Paris. So all the founding, you know, you got John Jay, who later is Supreme Court Justice, and Benjamin Franklin, and John Adams, among others, they're all there to negotiate this treaty. So they hired a painter to paint all of the people that are involved in this. So they sat down and got painted and they were like, okay, British guys, it's your turn to sit down, you know, for a couple of days. And the Brits were, of course, were like, we're not doing that. We lost. Screw that. So uh, the painting was never finished. And it's, it, it's become a famous painting because it's kind of a symbol of the broken relationship with England, if you will. So anyway. And this is, I, I love my documents, I'm, a, I'm an archivist, so this is the actual signatures on the, uh, the Treaty of Paris. And those weird red splotches are actually wax. So the way they used to write documents is once everybody signed it, they'd have these seals and then have this ribbon that they would tie the document up with. And that's, that's all those weird splotches are. But again, you can see, you know, people like John Adams and Ben Franklin and John Jay there. So that's it. I mean, you can have a documentary to watch that gives you a lot more detail, but I gave you some of the basics today. Uh, but this is what North America looked like. You have Spain still in Mexico, and as you can see, um, quite a bit of Texas and Arizona and California. Uh, the Brits are up in Canada. Um, France has all that middle part, and then we're the yellow and purple. You know, that's who we are at this point. All right. That's the revolution. Next lecture will be about the Constitution. That'll be a nice short one. Okay, thank you guys.